Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and in this video we will talk about medications and their use in children. Important for this topic is to remember that children are not just small adults. There are many differences in medications that can be used and how they are dosed and this video should help to understand how the mechanism of action is different in children how certain medications are metabolized differently in children than adults, and which effects medications can have in children that we can't usually see in adults. As childhood is quite a time frame and a 17-year-old child is not really easy to compare with an infant, let's start to talk about a baby before it is born and the aspects of drug therapy in this stage. So what are the factors that a medication can get from the mother's circulation to a fetus? And how does it impact the developing baby? Factors that play an important role in the access of the drug to the fetus are lipid solubility, molecular size, protein binding and placental and fetal metabolism. Lipid soluble medications can easily cross the placenta, while ionized medications don't. For example, thiopental, a barbiturate, which is given as an anesthetic, can easily cross the placenta and can lead to sedation and apnea in the fetus. Salicylates are ionized at blood pH and don't usually cross the placenta, but sometimes small amounts that are not ionized can cross the placenta and be trapped there. The next factor, molecular size. The placenta usually excludes drugs that have a high molecular weight. Medications with a molecular weight over 1000 don't usually diffuse through the placenta or only very poorly, while medications with a molecular weight of 250 to 500 easily penetrate the placental barrier and reach the fetal circulation. One exception for this is the maternal antibody globins which can cross the placenta even though they have a higher molecular weight. Plasma protein binding of a medication also usually inhibits the placental transfer. A tighter binding inhibits more crossing than a weaker binding. Also to keep in mind is that the plasma protein affinity may be different in the fetal and maternal circulation. This can lead to a fetal plasma concentration of a drug being higher than in the maternal plasma and is usually the case for sulfonamides, barbiturates, phenytoin and local anesthetics. Also important is the placental and fetal drug metabolism. The placenta is an important site of drug metabolism, especially oxidation reactions of aromatics. For example, phenobarbital is oxidized in the placenta. For the fetal drug metabolism, it is important to know that around half of the umbilical venous blood enters the fetal liver. Now we will talk about the pharmacodynamic aspects of drug action on the fetus. Important factor here are different effects of medications on the mother and the range of effects on the fetus. The maternal drug action describes the circumstance when a pregnant woman has certain conditions that require her to take medications throughout pregnancy, but also before and after. This includes, for example, pregnancy-induced heart failure, in which case the mother might take diuretics, or pregnancy-induced diabetes, which can in some cases require the treatment with insulin. These medications, but also other medications that I didn't describe now, can affect the fetus or the fetal drug metabolism. Other medications that a mother might take from before the pregnancy can potentially harm the fetus. Opiates, for example, can cause a dependency in the fetus and once it is born and is not exposed to them anymore, the neonatal withdrawal syndrome might occur. Other medications with toxic action on the fetus include ACE inhibitors, which are toxic to the developing fetal kidney. Some medications even have a teratogenic effect and can result in characteristic malformations, which indicate a selectivity of action of the drug. The teratogenic effect is usually dose dependent and acts predominantly at a defined stage of fetal development. 
Also from the side of the fetus, it might be necessary to give medications to treat certain conditions. This can include, for example, corticosteroids, which are used to stimulate the fetal lung maturation when a premature birth is expected, or phenobarbital, which is used to induce fetal hepatic enzymes, with glucuronidate bilirubin. Now I would like to talk about a few medications that have a teratogenic drug effect. The first group is the antibiotics. Aminoglycoside antibiotics are known to cause deafness and vestibular damage, tetracyclines anomalies in teeth and bones, fluoroquinolones can cause arthropathies, and sulfonamides can cause hyperbilirubinemia and kern icterus. If you want to know more about hyperbilirubinemia, you can see our video on that in the pediatrics playlist. Anticholinergics can cause a meconium ileus, anticoagulants as warfarin can cause skeletal and CNS defects. Anticonvulsants used for epilepsy also can have teratogenic effects. Carbamazepine and valproic acid can cause a neural tube defect, phenytoin a growth retardation, and trimetadione can cause CNS and facial defects. Antidepressants as lithium can cause hypotonia, hyporeflexia, and a reduced sucking reflex, which can make feeding difficult. Beta blockers can cause a growth restriction, neonatal bradycardia, and hypoglycemia. Antithyroid drugs used to treat thyrotoxicosis can cause neonatal hypothyroidism. Cytotoxic drugs as methotrexate and cyclophosphamide can cause CNS and limb malformations, as well as secondary cancer. Furosemid, a diuretic, can cause a decreased uterine blood flow and hyperbilirubinemia. Tyocyte diuretics can cause neonatal thrombocytopenia. Hypoglycemics as chlorpropamide and glibenclamide can cause neonatal hypoglycemia. NSAIDs can cause premature closure of the ductus arteriosus. Salicyclates can cause hemorrhage, and sex hormones can cause genitourinary defects. Sedatives as thalidomide can cause shortening of the limbs and hearing defects, and psychoactive drugs as barbiturates, benzodiazepines, and opioids can cause a neonatal withdrawal syndrome. As you can see, the list is very long, which makes it especially important to advise the patient as early in pregnancy as possible ideally before the patient becomes pregnant, to go through the patient's medications and, if necessary, initiate a cessation or change of medications. Also, some medications that a mother takes can have an effect on lactation. This can be either in the form of medication being excreted in the breast milk or medications that decrease lactation. Bromocryptine, ergotamine, cabercoline, Lyseride and metergoline are known to inhibit prolactation, a hormone which usually stimulates milk production. Estrogen antagonizes the milk production effect of prolactin and so also inhibits lactation. Clonidine, a blood pressure medication, inhibits the milk ejection and decreases the maternal prolactin levels. Thiazide diuretics suppress lactation. Now we will talk about drug concentration in breast milk. Most drugs are excreted into the breast milk by passive diffusion from the blood into the milk, which leads to the drug concentration in the milk being directly proportional to the maternal drug plasma concentration. The breast milk is more acidic than the blood plasma, so drugs that easily cross into the milk are usually weak bases, water soluble or lipid soluble and poorly bound to proteins. To understand how high the concentration of a medication is in the milk compared to the plasma, we usually use the milk to plasma ratio. Amoxicillin, an antibiotic, has a high milk to plasma ratio of around 0.014 to 0.043, while for example warfarin has a very low ratio of less than 0.01. There are few principles that can guide the management of cases of drug exposure in children that are breastfed, 
when the mother is taking some medication. The human milk medication concentration usually does not exceed the mother's plasma concentration. Short exposure to a medication is usually less of a concern than if medication is given regularly for a long period of time. Medication concentration in breast milk is difficult to predict and usually the information we have on it is empirical. The actual values for a specific case may vary. However, the effect on the infant is usually lower than the effect on the mother as the dose that reaches the infant comes from the free plasma concentration of the mother as the medication bound to plasma proteins does not cross to the infant. The amount of medication that is ingested can be minimized by feeding the infant just before or at the timing when the mother takes the medication, as the levels of medication in the maternal blood will be the lowest just before taking in another dose. When medications are expected to reach the infant in appreciable amounts, usually over 10% of the medication dosage that a mother takes, the medication should be avoided or changed to another one. Some medications that regularly cross into the breast milk include tetracycline antibiotics. Around 70% of the maternal serum concentration can be found in the breast milk and it leads to permanent tooth staining in the infant and also bone abnormalities. Fluoroquinolones, another group of antibiotics, can have an adverse effect on the development of the cartilage of the child. Diazepam and other sedative medications can lead to sedation in the infant and can cause accumulation due to their long half-life. Chemotherapeutic agents can also readily pass into the breast milk and can cause immunosuppression and neutropenia in the child. Lithium reaches around the same concentration in breast milk as in the maternal plasma and can lead to tremor and involuntary movements. Acetylsalicyclic acid or aspirin can lead to Ray syndrome and should be tried to be avoided as much as possible in children under the age of 16 years. The symptoms of Ray syndrome include encephalopathy with cerebral edema and liver damage. In the next part we will talk about clinical pharmacokinetics, so the rate of movement of medications within biological systems and as they are influenced by absorption, distribution, metabolism and elimination of the medication. All those four steps have differences between infants and adults and we will try to simplify them in the next part. When a medication is injected intramuscularly in a child, it is important to know that the blood supply, blood flow and muscle mass influence the absorption of the medication. Infants usually have a smaller muscle mass compared to older children or adults. Conditions as respiratory distress syndrome or shock decrease the blood supply to the muscles and lead to decreased absorption of the medication from the muscle. Muscle tissue is more acidic than blood, so for example phenytoin, which is converted into an acidic form, is absorbed slower from the muscle than in the blood. Absorption from the GI tract is influenced by the pH levels of the stomach, as well as the rate of gastric emptying and the peristalsis. The gastric acidity slowly rises in premature infants, and the gastric emptying time is longer in neonates than older children. This slows down the absorption rate. The peristalsis is usually also slower in neonates and can decrease the intestinal absorption. The bacterial flora differs from children to adults and affects hydrolysis of medications that are usually conjugated and excreted in the bile. Examples for this are vitamin K and the other fat-soluble vitamins E, D and A. Important to note is also that the medication distribution in infants is different compared to older children or adults as they have a higher body water content and a higher adipose tissue content. The distribution of water-soluble medications is determined by the amount of extracellular water, so the concentration of water-soluble medications is higher in babies as they have a higher water content. Fat-soluble medications distribute differently in newborns than older children as they have a higher amount of adipose tissue. 
Digoxin, for example, accumulates in smaller amounts in immature infants and older children. As in prematurity, the fat content is usually around 1%, while in full-term babies it is usually 15%. Now we will talk about the elimination of medications. This is usually done by organs working with the medication and changing it so that it can be eliminated from the body. The main organs of excretion are the lungs, where the remnants of the medication are expired into the air, the gastrointestinal system, where the medication is excreted via the bile and feces, and the kidneys, where the medication is excreted via the urine. The glomerular filtration rate is lower in neonates and children. In the first week of life of a full-term baby, the GFR, is around 30 to 40 percent of an adult's GFR, while in week 3 it is around 50 to 60 percent of an adult's GFR. The adult GFR is usually reached by around 6 to 12 months of age. This means that the elimination of a medication is lower in children. Also, conditions that reduce the GFR further reduce the elimination rate. This includes, for example, heart failure to which we have a separate video in our pediatrics playlist. The tubular secretion rate is around one-fourth to one-half of the adult level and reaches the adult level at around one to three years. To recap it, children metabolize and excrete medications differently than adults, so it is important to keep in mind that we can't just rate down the dosage for an adult to the weight of a child. Pediatric medication doses have to be chosen carefully and a thorough examination of the child is important before prescribing medication as concomitant diseases can influence the empirical values of drug metabolism. That's it for this video, thank you for watching and if you like our channel, please subscribe. Thank you very much and hopefully see you again in the next video.